Okay, let's get started here. Welcome back after spring break here. Um, so there's a few things we need to talk about before we uh, get back into the notes. Um, our class for Thursday is canceled. Uh, the reason being is because my dad is having a small minor uh, surgery and uh, he needs someone to take him to the doctor's office and bring him back. So I will be actually up in Omaha that day. Um, uh, and unfortunately, the only time that the doctor does these surgeries is on Thursdays. Oh, well. Uh, so we won't have class. Um, now, I, I would prefer not to miss class, because we've already missed one class before. So uh, what I thought we would do is essentially do evaluations on Thursday. And originally I was thinking, okay, well, I don't have to be here for evaluations because I'm not supposed to be present for evaluations. I could just have you do it in class. And I thought, well, why don't I just give you the evaluations you can take, take them home, do the evaluations on your own, and then return them on the following Tuesday in class. So that's what we're going to do. Um, so I have the evaluation, uh, the instructor evaluation forms here. There's, if you haven't had me before a class before, you don't know this, but I actually um, do two different sets of evaluations. Would you please take one and pass it back? So the first one that's being passed around is the standard INR evaluation form that they've used probably for at least 20 plus years. Um, and the second one that's coming around is uh, kind of an older form too, uh, but I think it I personally think it gets at the, the main questions of interest uh, more directly than uh, the old INR form. So that's why I like to have my students do two sets of evaluations. Typically, I give students a half hour during the class to complete the evaluation. So uh, by you doing it, by taking it home, you, in the essence, are only um, uh, missing perhaps 45 minutes of our normal class. So these evaluations are important. Please fill them out. They are the only way that, um, uh, that the university actually has to evaluate my teaching. If you would like to do, uh, type your responses for uh, the second evaluation, I've actually included links to the Word document that contains this so that you don't have to write it out. It's OK for you to. Um, uh, say exactly the same thing on both sets of evaluations. In fact, I, I hope you do, um, uh, because these are separate evaluation tools. So the next Tuesday, what you'll do is you'll bring your evaluations in back to the classroom, and at the very end of the class, I will leave, and you can then put your evaluations in this envelope. Okay, and then I'll have to have one student in our class take them up to the office. Okay, are there any questions about these evaluations? Okay. Now, with respect to, I guess, the other about 45 minutes or so that we would be missing on Thursday, what I hope to do, but I'm not going to guarantee it, what I will hope to do is actually uh, record the lecture myself, either on Wednesday or on Friday. Uh, if I can't get it to it by Friday, 5 p.m., don't worry, you're not responsible for any kind of uh, lecture. Uh, but what I hope to do is just simply sit in front of my computer, go through the lecture like I would essentially normally in class, um, and record it. Um, and if I'm able to do this, what I will do is I will post a link to the where you see the video on April 2nd. I will post a link to the actual recorded video there, and I will post something to the listener saying, hey, I did have time to record my lecture. Please go there and watch it before our next class. Yes. Uh, quick question about the videos. Uh, I don't know if it's, it's my computer or whatever. I have not been able to run the videos. Like mm -hmm. I was trying to go to the parallel video to do the assignment. Mm -hmm. And I have been trying since Sunday and have not had the chance, even with Explorer or with Chrome. I, don't uh, know. I, I haven't had any problems. Let's Anybody else? try it out. Yeah, I can. Could you? That's the only, yeah. that's the only way uh, 
watch the radio on in the airport and we put the laws in our car and not the radio or something like that. Yeah, you know, my own and I you should thought that maybe of course we don't want my problems I'm having, but then yesterday else I couldn't do it. I've been trying on and off for maybe the last four years. You know, I mean, what I would say in those situations, although it didn't work for Brianna, is to uh, um, Outside yeah, tr try, try it in a different browser. Uh, also, that's why I, I put at the very bottom there uh, a, a, a link so you can download it. But I would right-click and save target as versus trying to just click on it and open it. Okay. You know, these files are about 400 meg, 500 meg. Um, they are out there. I do know that. I don't know why th these problems occur. Okay. Uh, you know, every time that I've tried at least this semester, I've had success. And I've tried it on two different computers. Yeah. Well, they were working. And we are ab obviously having success right now. Right. What I would strongly recommend, though, is when you when you view it in a browser like this, don't uh, try to fast forward because that can cause problems. Yeah. Uh, because unfortunately, uh, the uh, uh, the browser somehow uh, puts it into cache, you know, the, the video. And if I try to fast forward to, let's say, you know, this right here, the browser for some reason thinks, okay, the video is actually only, you know, that long. And that's it. And it will not uh, try to download anymore. Yeah, so. Unless you remove your browser's memory. So you cannot do that. You cannot even, like I have not been even able to open two windows, like two tabs and run two videos. Like I sometimes forget maybe that will do it. Like two different class videos. It won't do that. And and they were working fine before the exam because I watched the I rewatched the videos. Mm -hmm. But since last week I have not been able to do it. None the not the parallel well, package one and the HPC one. At least I I have not changed how I how I've been doing the videos except for the first two weeks of, of, of class. And I'm sorry that that occurs. I wish I knew exactly what the solution is. Yeah. Uh, you know, at the very least, you know, you could always download it on one of the computers that we have in the department, put it on a flash drive, and take it back to your computer. Mm -hmm. That's why I've been leaving that link there for, to download the video outside this web page. I haven't tried the save target yet, so okay. I should try that. I was just clicking there, it wouldn't do anything. Okay. But anyway, thank you. Yep. Any other questions about that? Make sure I want to, I have discussed everything that I need to. Okay, so assignment number four, I've moved the date, the due date, to Wednesday, April 8th, to give you a little bit more time uh, since we're still finishing up the HPC section and that will give you uh, that Tuesday April 7th to ask any last questions in class that you may have about that uh, assignment. I do have assignment number five written. I spent my spring break doing that but that's one of the things I would spent on my spring break. I hope you had as much fun as I did. <laughs> I have written it. I have decided though on exactly um, I might, might scale it back a little bit in terms of the length. Uh, given how close we are to uh, the, uh, the the presentations, <clears throat> with respect to the presentations, obviously they are uh, coming up. Uh, for the presentations themselves, what you need to email me at least 24 hours prior to your presentation are your slides that you will be presenting, your homework assignments and the answer key in any additional materials that you may be needing for your um, corresponding presentation such as maybe in our program. I need to have that at least 24 hours prior because I'm going to start taking a look at them before you do your presentation. And that will allow me, if, if needed, to alert you to potential problems. So for example, I've had students unfortunately plagiarize stuff in their presentations, and so I was look. I would look. Well, one student in particular, I looked at it and saw that, and I said, "Hey, you can't do that." And that I emailed the student back, and the student made the appropriate changes, and that uh, allowed the students to get 
a lot higher grade than they would have otherwise as the plagiarism was removed. Now, for uh, when you do your presentation uh, the day of the class, uh, you know, please bring your uh, bring handouts that have the corresponding slides on it so that students can take notes on them. Um, I will put links to your presentations uh, the, in terms of the handouts, um, any other materials that you give me, I will put links to those materials on my course website too so that students can, let's say, download our programs if needed. Everything will be recorded as well and hopefully at the end of the class we will talk more about that. Okay, so are there any questions before we get going here? Okay, so we left off last time we're actually going to backtrack a little bit. We're going to go to page 41 of the notes. <clears throat> so we were talking about parallel processing on Tusker, which you can do equivalently on Crane. And uh, we were talking about uh, using the parallel package. And so let's uh, re, uh, go back over this example again. Uh, we were just about done with it last time, but I think it will be good for us to review uh, by going over it again. And so what we want to do is estimate the true confidence level for a confidence interval involving sigma squared. We've done these calculations in the past, but just not in a parallel sense. If you remember, we have six different intervals, where four of them are bootstrap intervals. And this is what my actual program looks like in TIN. So at the top of the program, I actually simulate my corresponding data. So I'm going to have 500 different data sets and the way that this data is arranged, I'm going to have 500 rows representing each data set. There are going to be nine columns as well in my resulting matrix. So I have samples in size nine. Now to do the parallel processing itself, first of all, say, hey, I want to use the parallel package. Uh, then if I want to keep track of the time, I can uh, use proc.time. I uh, ask R to make, in this case, uh, I'm, I'm going to use two cores. I set my C number, and then I use the par L applied to actually do the parallel processing. I specify the cores, and then I have to put my data into a list. Um, and so in this case, I'm just testing it out uh, to make sure everything works first. And I am going to use uh, two simulated data sets for one core two simulated data sets for another core. Yes? Yeah, what is it called in the trip? Excuse me? What is it called in the trip? Where is the what? What is it called, John? What is it called today? How is the special? Using threads and you say core. Yes, I'm, I'm using threads, sorry. So, <clears throat> so the actual function that I'm using for each thread uh, note that in this case, since I'm using two cores, um, I'm sorry, since I'm using two threads, it would actually be two cores. You know, if I was using, let's say, on a, maybe a laptop that only had two cores, and I had specified make cluster four, then I would be using four threads on two separate cores. Uh, so the function that I'm going to apply to each of the data sets is called per.core2, and this is what it looks like up here. Uh, this is basically the same as what we saw in the parallel processing section of this course, where now I have to actually set a working directory that corresponds to Tusker itself. You can do the same thing with uh, Crane. The actual uh, code that's being run, or main set of code that's being run on each core is in, is in the program run on each core.r. This is what it looks like. Notice how I ask uh, for library boot, first of all. And then I have a calc.t2 that's used to do some jackknifing. Calc.t calculates my statistic of interest and also the, the corresponding jackknife estimated variance. And then sim.func, finally, is what's actually calculating the, the, the main intervals. Where notice there's a call to the boot function inside of it. So if I come back to <coughs> my MC sim HPC parallel.r program, you can see then in the next line I use the apply function where I apply it to my data of interest. 
by row and I'm applying sim.func that we just saw in run on each core.r. What, what's returned then is then all the corresponding confidence intervals. Okay. Now at the very end, sim.intervals.pp is actually a list. It has two components and it has 250, um, I'm sorry, it has the intervals for 250 data sets in the first component and the intervals for the other 250 data sets as the second component. I need to put those com uh, two components together and the way I'm going to do that is with the rbind function with the help of do.call. At the very end then I say stop cluster to close out my, um, my uh, R background sessions that were created. Okay, are there any questions about that? So to, to actually run the code then, I can just simply go to Tusker uh, in the, the directory where I have the program. And the first thing I do is tell Tusker that I want to actually use R3.1. And then uh, to run the code, I say R command batch dash dash vanilla so that no .r data file is created. I specify my program and then I use the ampersand, ampersand uh, to allow me to get back to a command prompt. When I use the top command to take a look at what's occurring then on Tusker, uh, in particular the node that I am on, this is what it looks like when I had uh, uh, when I was using 10 separate cores. And you can see here that I have 10 uh, different instances of R at the top. They're all running. And the instance of R right here is the, the main instance of R that I'm actually using. And that's waiting now for the other 10 to get done. And this instance of R, when these are done, is going to put all the results back together. And we've already taken a look at uh, this little time plot. And there we go. So are there any questions? Yes. Well, one of the main things I don't have, uh, you, if you want to use a factory set, then you don't have all the specification to bring to your farm. If you have a package that you need to download, I didn't get the, the rest yeah. of it? And that package probably gets the specification to bring to your farm. It's, it's the what? Right. In French, the application to bring one to farm. If you are using factory, that's an application to bring two of them. Well, uh, very often those packages will run without any problems. You know, obviously um, there could be instances where you might not have uh, uh, be able to use the package fully if it's in a newer version of R. Eventually, at some point, uh, the people at HCC, Common Computing Center, will update the version of R. So until that happens, you're out of luck. If you really need something that's really focused on, let's say, the newest version of R. Yes? Um, so since we're going uh, 10 cores here, yep. that initial instance of R, yep. is that just uh, sitting idly? Yep, essentially. It's, it's basically waiting for those 10 other R's to finish. Okay, so there's not 11 R's running. There are 11 R's running, yes. Well, well one, one is just kind of in, 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 in a sleep mode. Okay. Gotcha. Any other questions? What if you were to do this and you have like only 10 threads or cores and you call uh, the 10 different well, in that case, it's not going to matter. I think you're getting it. Well, let's say that you have, let's say you want to uh, do 50 cores, and you only really have 10 available to you. Well, what will, what will probably happen is that, um, <clears throat> you know, some will run, and some will wait until okay. it, it can run again. Okay. You know, it's, you know, you can try it simply on your own computer. You mm -hmm. know, ask for more cores or more threads than are, than are available. Okay, so that's how you use the parallel package. Let's talk about how to use the for each package.
So in this case, I have my, my simulated data just like before. Let me actually close some stuff out here. I don't need it. So I have my simulated data, data as I just simulated before. And you know, with 4-H, again, it's a little bit more convenient. I have my main code that actually does the calculations inside my, my usual program. So you see my calc.t2, calc.t, my sim.func. And then I have to say library for each, library do parallel. I uh, ask for uh, 10, um, what ends up being 10 cores in this particular setting. You do need to remember to say register do parallel, uh, which you didn't have to do with the parallel package before. I set my, my C numbers, and then I use for each somewhat in the same manner as I would just the for loop uh, function that we've seen. I have 500 simulated data sets, so I'm going to loop over uh, uh, index uh, 1 to 500. In the end, I want to combine all the results via R bind, and I need the package boot to be open on every single uh, R instance. And so then I just simply you know, call sim.func for that particular, for the ith data set in this case. Of course, I say stop cluster in the end. So, you know, the code is not uh, uh, difficult. Uh, the, the, the thing that I ran into problems with, with, uh, uh, let me get back here, with trying to implement for each, is when I first started trying to do this a couple years ago, I would get this error here. Um, and I, I couldn't really figure out what was going on. And eventually, I, um, I decided to contact the Holland Computing Center and say, hey, could you help me out with this? Because this is not making sense to me at all. And what they said was, is that for some reason, R forgets about the location where for each and do parallel are located. Now remember, for each and do parallel are not in the default installation of R. You have to actually install it yourself. We looked at how to do that with the fortunes, func uh, fortunes package before. You basically have to carry out those same steps for this particular, uh, for these particular packages. <clears throat> and somehow, and I don't, to be honest, I don't understand how this can happen, but this is what they told me, is that R somehow forgets the location of where these packages are stored. And so we talked about a, a variety of solutions and what I think is the easiest solution is the one I'm going to show you here, even though on the surface it may not necessarily look easiest because it's not within R itself. And that is, in, in Linux, there are um, files that uh, basically store some default information, uh, also store uh, basically some profile information. These files are actually hidden to you, um, uh, just similar to how Windows hides files unless you ask for all hidden files to be shown to you. So in the main directory of where you log in uh, to uh, Tusker or Crane, uh, note that you would have to do it on each computer since they are separate computers. You need to do it on both of them. When you log into your home directory, you know, and you did do the list command, you, know, you see you know, just some files that might be located there. But there's actually some hidden files. And the way to see them all is to use the option dash all. And in particular here, the one that's of interest to us is this one called bash.profile. And this contains some various defaults of how um, things work uh, for you when you're, when you're logged onto the system. And you can actually edit dash Prof, uh, bat. You can edit dot bash underscore profile. Um, does anyone remember how you can edit it in, in Tusker? Does anyone remember the nano? Yeah, so you can say nano space that program name, or you could just simply upload it to your computer itself and edit it on your computer and then download it back. I'm sorry, download it to your computer, then upload it back. And this is what it actually looks like, this, uh, this file. It's very small. And, what, and if you notice here, this talks about home. That talks about, well, how can you simply get to your home directory? If you remember, I gave you a little um, shortcut of dollar sign home. Well, that's 
why that, that works, because it's some code right there. The thing that you just need to add is simply something something like this. It won't be exactly for you as the same for you. In particular, obviously, you don't need builder there. And so if you remember when we installed the fortunes um, uh, package, I say, I keep all my packages that I install in a particular location. Well, this is the location where I keep them all. So whatever you've chosen to install for each and do parallel, um, you would need to uh, put that location right there. And so that now, but you, it, it, our will know for sure where everything's located. You don't even actually need to use that function dot lib paths that I had shown you previously when we talked about the fortunes uh, function to specify where R should look for packages. That's enough. Um, so that's uh, the simplest solution. Any questions? Okay. So now what we've done so far is when we run our R programs on Tusker, we are actually running on the programs on one particular node. There's one node that when you log into Tusker, everyone log everyone is on. Okay, so if we all logged on to Tusker right now, we will all log on to the same node. Typically, when you're doing, let's say, a large Monte Carlo simulation study, or, so, or if you're using Tusker for some other, um, we'll call it big purposes, you're not going to want to run your program on that same node as everyone else. Because if everyone else is using it, well, the resources are going to be taken by it. Uh, but the Holland Computing Center says, okay, if you want to test out programs like what we've essentially done here, if you want to test them out, go ahead, you can run them on that node. But when you want to run the programs, let's say for real, where they might be running for hours, you need to specify or you need to run your program on a different node. And the way to do that is to use something called Slurm. What SLURM stands for is the Simple Linux Utility for Resource Management. In other words, what, you, what we're going to do is submit our program to SLURM. And SLURM is going to look at, well, how many cores does this person need? How much time is this program going to take? By factoring that, taking that information into account, it's going to try to find a node and cores to run your program on. Now, depending upon how many resources that you ask for, let's say if you ask for, let's say, 64 uh, cores, a single node with all 64 cores available uh, may not be available for you. And so what Slurm will do is basically hold your program uh, in reserve until the resources become available. Okay, so now the way then that we can use Slurm is that we have to actually write what's called a shell script file. It's actually very simple. Uh, basically, you can use my template whenever you want to. Uh, and, and, and a lot of the code in the, in, the, in the, or some of the code that's in this script file is essentially the code that we've been using at the command prompt already. We're just putting it into a file. But we're also going to put some other information there, such as, well, how many cores will I need for this program? Okay, so that gives you some background material. There's more information about how to use Slurm beyond than what I'm going to show you. There's nice documentation on the Holland Computing Center's webpage. In fact, they actually give you a nice uh, example um, uh, uh, shell script file that one could use uh, to do. Uh, to, to use an R program. I will dis discuss the components of that uh, in, in the context of an example shortly. So once you write your shell script file that again tells, tells Tusker essentially, you know, how many cores I need, what program I'm going to run, in terms of R program that is, 
Once you got that script file, in order to submit your script file to Slurm, you simply say s batch, then the script file name, whatever you call it. To check to see if it's running or if it's maybe uh, being held in what's called the queue, waiting to be run, you can say sq dash u for user and then your username. When you do that, you're going to see um, you know, the programs that you have available that, are be that have been submitted and next to them will be a number. That number can be useful if, let's say, you want to uh, uh, prematurely stop a program from running. Maybe you discovered an error. And so you can say S cancel, whatever that identification number is that you would see in doing that. Okay, so let's take a look at a simple example of using a shell script file to do this stuff. We're going to begin with my Hello World program once again. So notice I have two files there in parentheses. The first one is a shell script file. I just, I just simply make it an ASCII text file. And then the second one is the actual R program that's going to be called from my shell script file. So this is what the shell script file works like, or looks like. I have notes about each of the components of it starting on page 49. So you know you don't necessarily have to hurry, hurriedly uh, um, um, take notes here. Um, okay. So basically this first line here basically says, hey, I have a shell script file. Okay. The next stuff is what Slurm uses. So uh, let's see now. How many nodes do I want? For all the stuff that we're going to do in this class, we're just going to simply use one node. The n task per node says, well, how many cores do I want? In this case, I'm just going to use one. The time command here says, how long do I expect this to run? Um, I put one minute. Well, I have to be careful. You should put a time that's longer than what you would expect. Because if the program was still running at the end of one minute, Slurm would say, stop, you're done. So you need to make sure that you're specifying a time here longer than what you anticipate the program to run. But not too much longer. Let's say if I specify I want 24 hours for this program to run. Well, when Slurm then tries to find some available uh, cores for you, it's going to take that into account that you need something for 24 hours and, and because of that, that might delay uh, the ability of this program to get even started. How much memory am I going to use? No, well, let's say one gig. That's a lot more than what I need, but that's what I, I'm going to request. Job name corresponds to, well, what do I want to call this job? And it, this doesn't have to be the same as any kind of file name you have. It's just when you issue the command sq to see what's on the job queue, this is what's going to be used. So it's not a big deal. Just pick a name. Then, these next two files corresponds to, if there are any errors in my shell script file here, where will the errors be printed? Hello world, S-T-D-E-R-R. -R. Could use a different file name if I wanted to, I just decided to use that. If I had any output from my shell script file, which at least the way that we're going to be running it, we are not, but if I had some kind of output, where would it go? So the hello world std out. Then lastly, we have the same commands that we saw before that we were doing at the command prompt to actually run the R program. So that's it. A simple shell script file. Let's see. So let's take a look at what happens when I run this. And I'm just going to uh, use my notes on page 50 rather than running it interactively here. 
So I'm in the folder where my shell script file is, and where my, prog my R program is, and at the command prompt I say sbatch the shell script file name. Note that it does actually come back to me with a batch number two if I needed it. That's again what you could use for the, the, the scancel command. And then when I say sq-u builder, I did that immediately after I had typed then uh, the sbatch stuff and hit enter. You can see the job queue. So this is what happens. Uh, the, the name of my job is called test, because that's why I set in my shell script. PD means that it is, um, what's the, the exact uh, terminology? Uh, oh, I know I have that. It's basically, it's not running. Pending. Pending, thank you. And I'm using, going to use one node. Uh, then, right after that happened, I decided to, let's, let's issue that command again. Let's see if it's running it. Ah, it's still pending. And I kept on doing that, and eventually it finally started. So, ST stands for state. That means, and since there's an R underneath it, it means it's running. And this gives some information, I believe, and I'm not 100% sure, but I believe this gives information about which node is actually running it. Is it meaningful to us? Well, not, not really. But there is some node out there called C2903 that's running my program. And you can see how long it's taking. And then eventually, after I keep on issuing the SQ command, eventually nothing comes back because now my program's done. So that if I issued ls command in the same folder or directory, now you can see the, pro, the, the stuff that was created. So just like what we've done before, a .r out files created, my plot files created, but also the corresponding files for my shell script file are created too. Please note that there was a typo in my notes that should say slurm rather than pbs. Um, about year and a half to two years ago, um, uh, the Han Computing Center changed um, the system that it used to uh, to basically run these these uh, these files. Um, and now we use Slurm before we use something called PBS called Portable Batch System. And I unfortunately forgot to update that. Not that it's a big deal. Okay, so, you know, the output that you get then will be just exactly the same as what we saw before. Uh, do note that this program purposely took a little bit longer than um, it should normally um, because I, I added a function in my R program called sys.sleep20, means my program will essentially take an extra 20 seconds to run. Just so that we can see it on the queue. Well, that's the only reason why I did that. Now, here are some very useful commands to include in a, in, a, in, a, in a shell script file when you're using Slurm. In fact, I know at least one of you has already done this because I was getting an email message on Friday from somebody who was actually running this, running probably my, my sample programs, or my example programs, because that person forgot to change the email address there, and I was getting information that you were running it. So thank you very much. I'm glad people were working on their on these on this stuff over spring break. Um, so anyway, so what these uh, and I probably should have said this to begin with, what these commands do is that when your program ends, you will get an email sent to you. Very, 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 very useful. Because now you don't have to check the SQ to know when your program's done. I mean, especially when you have programs that will take hours or even days to complete. This tells you when it's done. I, in many instances in my career, both as a student while I was working on my dissertation, and then since then, I, when I have large set of Monte Carlo simulations to run, I always try to put some kind of component like this uh, so that I don't have to constantly check myself, especially if I'm using multiple computers. Um, in fact, I mean, when I was doing my dissertation, 
uh, what I, I did all my simulations in SAS, and I would have SAS email me the actual simulation results in the end. And that was very convenient. So change the email address to your own. Um, instead of having to type SQ, S, well, the SQ da, uh, dash you and your username, you want to do it that way. Instead of having to do that over and over again like I did, you could also do watch. Use a watch command, which will automatically update the, the queue uh, for you uh, every two seconds. So that's just another option. Okay. The next one's very important because it can be frustrating to uh, users that are new to Linux. Okay, so let's say that I typed up my. So where is it? Suppose I typed this program up, or the, the, the shell script file up on my Windows based computer. I uploaded it to. Um, uh, uh, to Tusker, <laughs> and I tried to run it, I would get an error. In fact, this is the error that I would get. Oops. Batch script contains DOS line breaks instead of expected Unix line breaks. So what does that mean? So at the end of every, at the end of every line here, you know, typically you hit enter to go down to the next line. Well, the way that Windows represents that line break is different than how Linux would represent it, unfortunately. Um, one good thing though is that it, this doesn't uh, this doesn't pertain to your R programs. Okay, I have no problems running R programs. Um, uh, on, 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 on Tusker or Crank. You know, I've only run into this problem with the shell script files. And so, essentially, as a hidden character, um, Windows, that's why you see DOS there, uses a slash R slash N to mean, okay, line break, go to the next line. Linux just uses slash N. Does anyone remember where they see that slash N before in R? Yeah. When we've used like a cat function and we want to move down to the next line, that's why that, that's used in R. So you need to somehow tell, um, uh, you need to somehow change these line breaks. There are two different ways. The least convenient way is to use the command DOS to Unix, where you simply say, at a command prompt, DOS to Unix, take your program that you just maybe uploaded from your Windows computer, and it will get the correct line breaks in there. The alternative way, which I think is better, but it might take a little bit more work on your end in terms of on your own computer, is to tell your text editor, wherever you're typing your, your script file, tell your text editor that you want the encoding to be for Linux rather than Windows. So, what do I mean by that? This is how I do it in TIN. So let me go to my one of my R programs here. And if you notice at the very bottom of the screen, you see Win. Okay, so that's my encoding right now. It's Windows based. Now, when I go to my shell script file, <laughs> notice what it says there. Unix. Okay, well, how did I tell TIN that I want to do stuff with respect to Unix rather than Windows. Well, the way to do that is to go up to encoding. And let's see now. So change line endings. I want to use a Unix based kind of line ending. Once I do that, that's why you see Unix there. Now I can upload it to uh, Crane, I can upload it to Tusker, and I don't have to use DOS to Unix. Everything will be fine. So that's how I do it in TIN. I've looked in our studio, and I'm pretty sure I was going to 
Maybe I didn't do that. Uh, so I'm pretty sure I looked in our studio and I can't find a way to do that. But I would recommend taking a look around. I know when I was going through my lecture notes last night, I was going to open up our studio. I think I got distracted on something else and I didn't do that to double check that. But I'm pretty sure from my past experience, our studio doesn't have a way to do that. Notepad does not have a way to do that. What can you use? If you don't want to use TIN, another thing that you could use is Notepad++. This is a free program that you can actually download from a corresponding Notepad++ website. And you can actually specify the encoding to be what you want. Or if you really want to, use Nano on, on Tusker or Crane and type up your Slurm file there. What do we get on these? Is that DOS do this? You can always do DOS Unix too. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, for this class, you know, you're not really having to do much. But, you know, if you're to use uh, Tusker or, or, or Crane outside of this class, you probably will want to, to do something like what I'm doing here. Okay. Any questions? So it takes us to page 53 then. So here's how I did my, um, my simulations now um, using the shell script file. You know, it's really not, not difficult. Um, I'm going to use 20 cores. So I specify I want 20 cores to be used. I specify 15 minutes. Uh, one node, let's give me four gigabytes. I want the results to be emailed me. I'm sorry. I want the, uh, the uh, I want Tusker to email me at the end when everything is done. And then I just run my program at the end, my shell script file. Can you add one line more than one thing? Run is more than one. On um, more than one node. I'll get to that. Uh, so if you want to. I don't know why I just put that there, because I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, if you issue the SQ command, and if you want just information about the number of, of cores you're using, well, use dash O percent sign C, and you get the number of cores used. Uh, do note that when I ran this program, R did not immediately start, uh, because I was asking for a lot of resources. So you really need to take that into account, um, you know, the more time you ask for, the more memory you ask for, the more cores you ask for, the slower it will be for your program to start running. It's something that you do need to definitely take into account. Okay. Now. Uh, I have a question. Yes. If we use the cl class, so uh, the maximum the core we can. Uh, we can apply these safety yep. for each node. Yep. Okay. So now there are other ways to run R from a shell script file. So one in particular I show right there. Um, and uh, basically the, the results will be returned to the specific out file that you specify in your sh shell script. Another way that you could do this is to use the R script program and have uh, essentially the results will be sent to the, um, uh, the out file that you specified in your shell script. Um, I personally have not had 100% success doing this, so that's why I don't run it that way. I'm fine with running it the way that I am, that I do. Now, Sean, did you say that you, you run it, you maybe run some of this stuff this way, where the stuff would come to your shell script file, output file, or, or am I wrong? Um, no, not to okay. an output file. Okay. Not necessarily. Well, never mind then, sorry. <laughs> well, what about using multiple nodes? Um, <clears throat> well, there is a package called RMPI that can do it. Also, the Snow package supposedly can do it as well. I think RMPI is newer, and so I would investigate that way first. <clears throat> However, I 
have not had an opportunity to fully investigate that. I did contact the Holland Computing Center about, about it, and it sounds like no one has done that there either. So that's why I had suggested that this could be one potential topic that one could present on uh, for in this class as well. Okay, how can we use our MPI to do this? And until um, we figure that out, we can see that um, Tusker has some advantages over Crane because you could use up to 64 cores on Tusker where you can only use 16 at a time on Crane. So I encourage you to take a, take a closer look at it. Um, I would love to know how to do it. Okay, so as you can see, I, in my investigations of little bit, when I did try to, to uh, do it, I had even problems um, installing the package myself. And uh, the people at Holland Computing Center have always been very nice and very helpful, and they gave me this very long uh, set of uh, commands to run at a command prompt to actually install it. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so just some, some stuff to finish up with here. You can run SAS at the Holland Computing Center on, on Crane and Tusker. Uh, we've kind of seen that before. Um, and, you know, again, uh, this would be free. As long as you have an account, you do, you're not paying for a license like you would if you were to put, put it on your own computer. Uh, in fact, I think, and I could be wrong, but I think a former professor at UNL, uh, that's how she ran SAS uh, for her, or had her students run SAS um, in her psych class that she was teaching. Uh, the students would just simply run it on, on Tusker or Crane for free. Um, she's actually not at University of Kansas. Uh, but what I've done is actually um, uh, created a, uh, I went back to my archives of using SAS programs and I ran it on Tusker just to see how it worked and it didn't, I didn't have any problems uh, using it at all. Um, all my stuff is in sas.zip. That's in my course materials or on my course materials webpage on my website. You know, similar to when we would use R, we would have to say module load sas slash 9.3. Uh, you get, if you've never run batch files before in sas, you actually get two different uh, files. You know, the, the, the log window that you see in Windows SAS, well, all that stuff goes to a .log file. And all your output goes to a .lst file. Um, we've also seen that there's many other programs that are available um, on Tusker and Crane. In particular, there is a C++ compiler if you want to use it. Um, a couple years ago, uh, while I was teaching my Tools for Statisticians class, uh, I had a student investigate uh, how to use C++. And uh, here's some information about how you can get a C++ program running on Tusker. Some other comments uh, to conclude with here. So, um, you know, obviously all of you have heard of cloud computing before. Uh, and that's just a, a big name to say, okay, uh, you know, the programs that you're running are essentially not necessarily stored on your own computer. Maybe they're stored someplace else. Or maybe some files you have are not stored on your computer, but they're stored on some central server someplace else. And, you know, Amazon has some really cool tools available for cloud computing. Uh, they're Amazon EC2 is a pay-as-you-go form of using supercomputers. Um, and uh, there is a free usage tier, though, although I have to admit that it is quite slow. Uh, but it allows, allows you to, at least if you want to investigate and use it, allows you to get some experience with it. And so you can use R on their computers. Um, it's really not too difficult at all. And lastly, some other resources. Um, and I just thought I'd put this here just to show you how other departments of statistics are actually using Linux-based computers. The departments of statistics that are fairly close to us, such as Iowa State and Missouri. 
Um, and also you can see some current research in this area at that link. And that concludes finally the high performance computing section. Are there any questions? Um, I actually do use our code within script files. Okay. Uh, caught off guard because I was looking at Sorry. <laughs> the computing center. Um, so I use bash scripts um, and I use the uh, R script command. Um, well, I did before this course um, to run all the R programs. Then I use a uh, program called No Up, No Hang Up. Um, and then you can use the uh, the greater or less than sign and output it to like a log.txt and then the uh, ampersand. Would it be possible if you could write a hello world program for us that shows us yeah. how to do that? Yeah. And then I'll post it to the website. Yeah. Because um, I mean, I've, I've seen, you know, the, uh, you know, just from my, my searches of how other people do it, I've seen some stuff like that and I've had some, some issues with getting it to run and I'm probably just missing something. Mm -hmm. So I would appreciate it if you yeah. send me some. Yeah. At least that's what Dr. Cat. Okay, good, good. I'll give it a shot. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe just take my Hello World program that I actually uh, did in the notes, mm -hmm. translate it to, 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 to that environment. Okay. Okay, uh, good. We do have some time left. So one thing that I want to talk about that's uh, related to the, uh, the presentations, and that is, uh, you know, I want to record all of your presentations similar to what I record uh, for my lectures in this class. Um, now ideally what I would like all of you to do is use your own laptop, bring it in here, set it up here, and do your presentation off your own laptop. Uh, but I want to record what's actually on your laptop screen and also the corresponding audio of what you're doing. We're not going to worry about any kind of uh, live action video from a webcam. Okay, so everything that you see in my videos, except for the live action part of me, I want to record. And the way that we're going to do that is through using uh, Camtasia Relay. Um, I think of some of you probably used Camtasia Relay before, uh, but probably a lot of you have not. And so I want to talk about how it works and also where you can obtain this program to try it out on your computer to make sure it does work. Okay, so if you go to the website after class called camrelay.unl.edu, I do want all of you to do that. So camrelay.unl.edu. Uh, you get to a place where you have to use your username and password. Now, I believe for all students, they can simply log in using your Blackboard login and password. Okay, so mine have to have, happens to be already listed there. If you cannot log in, let me know. And so you can log in here, and you can see some stuff that I've actually done for other classes. I typically have been using this to record all my classes, except for... I decided not to for this semester for a, a variety of reasons, but I'll probably be going back to this uh, next uh, next school year. And um, there are programs that are essentially free for you uh, that you can download that will do the recording. And so if I come over here to download Camtasia recorders, I have a number of different options. So on my own computer, I have this particular one here for Windows 8. I don't want you to download that one. Instead, I want you to download the portable recorder. This is a recorder or a program, an executable file, that you can simply put on a USB drive or SD card. And all the recording, when you're done, essentially will be transferred to that USB drive or that SD card. So if I just click on Save As, I'll download it. Out of this. And it will be as .zip file. Just, uh, uh, I guess, inflate the zip file. And this is the actual program that will do the recording. So if I click on that, it asks for a username 
in a password. Uh, don't worry about it. You can just do later. Or, yeah, I guess you can do later. And what I want all of you to do then is do a test. So I'm going to do a test right now. This is a test of my recording. This is only a test. So I hit stop. It's going to finalize my recording. You can see here now, it looks like, oh, this is what was on my screen. Let's see if it worked. I know you can't hear it, but I can hear it that indeed it did capture my voice too. So anything that's on my screen and also my voice through my, my computer's um, um, microphone will be recorded. I want you to all verify that indeed the computer that you're going to use for your presentation that this works. Because on the day of our presentation, I will give you a USB drive. You will plug it into your USB port, and we will record onto that. Is that clear? Any questions? If for some reason you do not have access to a laptop that you could bring in here, or if the laptop that you would normally use, that this doesn't work, let me know and we can use one of my old laptops. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, this is more regarding uh, presentations in general. What is the type of plug, um, the plug-in up there so you can sure. see the laptop? Is it, uh, like a it, it is, you, you have, actually, they just added an option. Uh, what I've been using all semester has been a VGA one, okay? Now they just added over spring break HDMI. Now, I wish they wouldn't have done HDMI because uh, I think where we're going to with all laptops uh, that we want to plug into a, a data projector, you know, we're going to uh, we use the, the, the mini display ports. And so this doesn't help me at all. Uh, it's like they're behind, you know, my laptop that I got about five years ago. It had one of these. Well, the one that I got, you know, a year and a half ago does not. So... I guess we're making some kind of progress. The one good thing, though, is that um, that they did over spring break is that now I can record my screen here without um, uh, going down in resolution. Uh, one thing I've always disliked about this classroom is that I've always had to reduce the resolution on my computer because otherwise uh, it wouldn't wouldn't project up. And now they have fixed it, so that I'm using actually using my native resolution. So that was one nice thing that occurred over spring break. Again, you need to try this out. Don't wait until the night before your presentation to try this out. Any questions? Can you share the Blackboard again? Okay. 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 For me. On on um, the, the Camtasia Relay website? Yeah. Oh. Hmm. So that's that. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, at least we're, <laughs> we're trying to get tenure as a grad student. Uh, you know, at least what I, I've been told is that, that all students can access it. Um, and Dola says yes. Uh, so I would try try it again, maybe outside this class. Um, and if that doesn't work, give give a quick call over to the 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 IS people to see if they can help you. Um, and if they if they cannot, let me know. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the main thing is, though, you just need to be able to try that portable recorder. So if you can get a copy of that recorder from somebody else, that would be fine. Um, and one, one of the reasons why I brought that up about how to do that is that, you know, especially for those, there's a number of students who are TAs in this class, this provides an ex easy way for you to record your own teaching. Very easy. I know at least a few other students in our department do use it. Okay, so if there's no other questions, why don't we move on to the next section then?
And for some reason, I don't have my notes open for it. So give me a moment. Okay, so we're going to talk about uh, uh, doing uh, derivatives in a numerical way. Um, there's a few notes that I want to make here. First of all, this is probably really the first section that corresponds to the required book for this class. I am sorry that that occurred. Again, I had to make a decision probably late September, early October about well, what book are we going to use for this class? And it was down to two. Uh, the book that is required, and also the book uh, by, um, I think it's Givens and Hotin, uh, the authors from Colorado State. I would have picked the one from Colorado State, except for I knew that it, the free version was available in our library. So that was good. And so I thought, okay, what would be most beneficial to the students then is for me to require this other book that wasn't um, you know, available through our library. That way you have the best, best of both worlds. You have both books. Uh, then, of course, at the very first day of class, I said, well, guess what happened over winter break? That this book that I had thought was going to be available for, through the library for free is no longer available for free through the library. So I'm sorry that that happened, but I don't have control over that. Um, maybe send your bill uh, for the book over to the library and have them deal with it. Uh, so, so the next actually three sections all correspond to stuff that's in the um, this 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 required book uh, and again at the time I didn't know exactly how long this would all take and in fact we're not going to even be able to get through everything that I had anticipated we would get to uh, through these sections um, but so so these and next let's look at the schedule here because I think that would be helpful so oops wrong, wrong course So the three sections I'm talking about are numerical differentiation, optimization, and numerical integration. Uh, these are common topics that are taught in a, in a computational statistics course. The reason being is because over the years, this stuff has become a lot more important for statisticians to know. But it kind of also another reason is, I think it's actually kind of disappointing, is that um, I would say the majority of students who come into a in a master's program in statistics, and then also a PhD program in statistics, have not taken a numerical analysis class at the undergraduate level. Um, just out of curiosity, how many of you had a numerical analysis class in the, at an undergrad? Okay, so we got four out of eight, it sounds like, or maybe five out of eight. Uh, that's more than I anticipated. You know, I've looked through a lot of uh, transcripts uh, since I've been on the graduate committee uh, for many, many, many years for applicants uh, to our department in, in, in the past ones at Oklahoma State. And, and it's just, it's kind of disappointing seeing the number of students who take that numerical methods class is really significantly dropped when that's actually one of the most important classes you can get at the undergraduate level before you go to a master's or PhD program in statistics. Because the stuff that you do there is going to be directly applicable to the stuff, um, like doing a generalized linear mixed model, for example. Well, that requires some kind of numerical integration. Okay, so that's why a numerical methods class where you would learn that kind of stuff would be so important. Well, because of that, because of that, that, that background issue, um, you know, I've, I've kind of struggled with determining, well, what should I talk about in a computational statistics course, and what don't I need to talk about? Um, I hope I found some kind of compromise where, you know, some of the stuff is going to be review. I would imagine for all of you, the R aspects will be new. Uh, so I, I might be emphasizing the R stuff more because after all, typically, but not always, uh, what we need as statisticians is a way to use these mathematical methods. Not necessarily to forward the mathematical methods, but a way to use them. So I want to fit a generalized linear mixed model. Okay, show me how to do quadrature. Okay, I can implement it. There we go. That's all you need. 
there are times in research where you might have maybe a tough, let's say, optimization problem, and then you might need to know a little bit more about, well, how does this actually work, this method, this mathematical method? Um, and there are cases like that. So anyway, I hope that what we're going to do here is going to give you, a, you know, enough background so that you can apply these mathematical techniques um, uh, to solve statistical problems and maybe also give you the background to start any kind of research that might involve them. So, you know, so much in statistics, we need to take a derivative. Um, at times, you know, we can just simply do it by hand. But, you know, the, the, the farther you go along in your statistics career, the more messy these derivatives get. So you might be able to maybe just say, hey, computer, just do it for me. And also, at times, you want to maybe develop a, an automated method that, you know, it doesn't matter what your function is, if there's, like, little changes to it, you want to be able to do something almost automatic. And the way to do that is to take a numerical derivative rather than, for all possible cases, program into R what the derivative would actually be. And so that's what this section allows you to do. Some auto, gives you some automated ways to do these derivatives. Um, and I've talked a lot here for the last few minutes. Uh, I don't think it was really going to be useful for us to actually get into the in, into depth about what these methods are right now. And so um, what we'll do is just call it a day. Oh, that clock is slow, by the way. Uh, are there any questions? Okay, that's it for today. Then.